Well, amen, band, worship team, thank you so much. Shelly, thank you for doing that song. Shelly and I were talking this week, and, and uh, I said, you know, can you, can you do Solid Rock, the old hymn? And she said, well, well yeah. I, I said, do it before I preach. Because um, honestly, uh, that, that old hymn is very much about uh, the, the, the message today. One of, the, one of the problems that we have in our, our culture today is, is, is this idea of, of picking sides. You know, I'm a fill in the blank. And, and, and I, had, I had somebody the other day was telling me, a preacher said, Carl, you know, you need to be very careful that you don't pick sides. And I said, what? He said, man, you, a, a Christian cannot pick a side in this culture. Uh, your job's not to be a Democrat or Republican. You can't not pick a side. I said, well, I, I hate to tell you this, but I picked a side a long time ago. And I, I looked at him and said, I, there's no way that a Christian can't pick a side. He said, well, which side are you on? And I said, neither one of them. He said, you've got to. I mean, those are the only two choices. And I went, man, have you ever studied the Bible? Well, well Carl, I've got a degree in a seminary just like you do. Well, okay, good. I said, you ever read the Old Testament? His aspiration, he, I said, you know, there was a time that the Israel had, had crossed the Jordan River and Joshua was in charge and they'd come outside this small little city and, and they, they were, they were going to attack. But before they could attack, Joshua looks up and he sees this huge army of just monster, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger type guys. Not short though like him, but I mean tall big guys. And, and uh, you know, army just started trembling, you know, said, you know, they're, they're, they're bigger than us, better armed than us. And Joshua said, listen, you go, you go, you go ask them whose side they're on. Before we attack, we've got to know who we're facing. And uh, just, just like today, and, and you know, who, 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 you know, who is this? And uh, the guy said, you know, I'm, I'm not on your side. I'm not on their side. I have come as an emissary of the Lord God, Jehovah. I'm not on your side or their side. I'm on God's side. As a Christian, you and I, a, a long time ago, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, Jesus Christ became our identity. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. As we look at the church in, in Pergamum, it is, it is a call for God's people to come out from among them. In the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul said, therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. What I'd like you to notice in this passage of scripture in, in Revelation chapter 2, that, that there is a voice the voice of God calling the church to come out from among them. Notice verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has a sharp and double-edged sword. He, he says, God's sword, this, this sword that, that is behalf of God is, is not just a saber that's sharpened on one side, but it's a sharp, it's a sword that, that sharpened on both sides. It, it's one of those that you can take and you can run it along your arms flat and the hair just kind of falls off. You can tell it's a sword that I don't have because it's sharp enough to shave your face. It's a sword Jeff Wigley's never even seen. You know, his beard is kind of like, you know, this. Can you just imagine Jeff, you know, shaving with a, okay, all right, okay. What is this he's talking about, this sharp double-edged sword in Hebrews 12, 4, 12? For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit, 
of the joints and the marrow, and he is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The writer of Hebrews is speaking about the sword, which is the very words of Jesus Christ. So, so this angel, this angel, which means messenger to the church, said, these, these are the words of Jesus Christ. They, they are designed to do what? In Hebrews 4.12, they're, they're designed to cut away the soul and the spirit and the joint and the marrow. I uh, had a good friend who, who had, had cancer and, and uh, they, the, the doctor said, no, no what we're going to do is, 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 is we're going to open him up and then we're going to, we're, we're basically going to cut away the bad part until we get to the good part. That's what the words of Jesus Christ are designed to, to do in our life. They're to go inside of us, into our heart and our mind and our very soul and cut out the gunk to, to excise the infection of the lostness of humanity. There's some things that you need to understand about this, this Jesus Christ is that, is that he is uniquely and pointedly aware of where you are in your life. I mean, think about it. How many of us go through our day at times maybe feeling sorry for ourselves or hurting and we, we know that nobody knows You know, we, we tell people all the time, if you want to come over to our house and visit us, come right on. You're welcome anytime. We live at 2520 Wood Creek. It's one block behind the K. Roger. There, the K. Rogers? Oh, Kroger, y'all call it down here. K. Okay. My, my doctor calls it K. Roger. So if you want to come see us, come anytime. If you want to come and look at the house and the new kitchen countertops, make an appointment. Do you understand what I just told you? My mom and dad, I grew up in a museum and, and everything was perfect and everybody, everything had its place and, you know, that, that type of thing. And, and uh, you know, I'm one of those guys, I don't want to track dirt in the house, so I take my shoes off at the door. So if you don't want to see my shoes next to the door that I just cut the grass in, let me know and I'll make sure they're moved in the right spot. But, but it's just, it's just, it's just the, 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 the way that we are. It's, it's who we are. And you say, Carl, why are you telling this? Can I ask you a question? What is it about your life that you hide from people? Do you hide your thoughts? Do you hide your fears? Do you hide your, hide your concerns? I'll be quite frank with you, almost everybody that comes through the door of this church on Sunday morning or are watching us by Facebook or YouTube, uh, sit, sitting, sitting at home, when they see people act as though nothing at all is going on in their life, that everything's just fine, everything's just perfect. I can't remember the last time I greeted somebody and said, how you doing? They didn't look at me and say, I'm doing fine, doing good. And the truth about it is, is that half of y'all just lying through your teeth. You know it, and I know that you know that I know that you're lying through your teeth. But you're not going to tell the truth. Why? Because, because we don't want people to know. Notice, notice what he says in verse 13. His first things is, is he said, I know where you live. I, I know what's going on in your life. I know what you're struggling with. I know what your concerns are. I know that you're hurting. You, you don't have to worry about the great cover-up hiding something for me. <coughs> you don't have to make sure that I make appointments so that when I come to your house, the house is all clean and perfect. Because I know where you live. 
Where is it that I, I know that you live? I, I, I know where you live, where Satan has its throne. Whew. How would you like to live in the capital city of Satan? That was Pergamum. He said, yet you remain true to my name. You, you did not renounce your faith to me. And even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives, the, the, the temple of Ascalopes was there. And he was, he was the snake god. And I, I, I want to tell you, I, I, I've never tried to call religions other religions foolish, but I want to tell you, whoever came up with this one had mental problems. I, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. This, this God, they, they had a temple for this God in the, the center of the city, and it was next to the temple of Caesar Augustus. But if you were sick, you would go to Pergamos, and you would go to this temple and at night, when the priest would leave, they'd turn off the lights and you'd put a cot in the floor. I, I'm not making this up. You'd put a cot in the floor and lay down, and, and the priest's jobs were to work with the snakes. Boy, that'll just bless your heart. Can you imagine a young lady dating a young man? Oh, you're going to seminary? Oh, what kind of seminary are you going to? Well... Well, I'm going to the seminary where they teach you how to tame snakes. Well, well, what are you taming snakes for? Well, when I lay down to sleep at night, my job is to let my snake out so the snake slitters on the ground up next. And when the snake lays down and crawls over sick people, the snake makes them well. Do what? Well, I heal people by laying snakes on them while they sleep. Guys, you can't, you can't make this up. Can you imagine? Honey, what's wrong? Well, I kind of got the sniffles. You better go lay down in the temple so they can stick a snake on you. <laughs> I, I don't know if, if he's trying to refer that that, uh, you know, going back to Genesis, that, that, uh, that Satan was called the serpent. And I, I don't know if it's the city, it's the head capital of, of Satan because of that. I, I don't know if it's that because it was the first temple that they actually designed to worship one of the Caesars, which was Caesar Augustus, that was built 50 years before the temple to the Caesars, to the emperors, that was built in the last, I, I don't know, but but it was a, a city of idol worship. But, but the description is, is not just that, but, but what blows me away, he says, now, now also, it's, it's not just the city where they, where they worship the snakes, but it's the city where Antipas was martyred. You, you can study the entire Bible. The only time this guy's mentioned is in this text. Antipas, my faithful servant, the martyr. Matter of fact, in, in Roman history, you can't find his name. But it's mentioned that at this one moment, Antipas is, is a word which is the compilation of two. Anti, which means against, uh, uh, against and pass all. See, where I, 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 I came up with this idea that, that we're called by God to come out from among him is that Jesus is saying, I just want to know, I know that you live in the middle of satanic worship, in the middle of idolatry worship, but I also know that there was a guy there that stood against everyone. He was martyred because of his faith. The word martyr in the ancient Greece, in the ancient Greek, martus, actually is, is a most interesting and suggestive word. In classical Greece, Greek, martus never meant martyred as in the sense of being killed, but, but it talks about a martyr is a witness 
the one that stands up and says, this is true and I know it. He said, I know where you live. I, I know that you live in the middle of a, of a cultic worship place, but there is this one man who stood up against everyone and says, this is what is true, and I know that it's true, and I am a witness to it. What I believe that we need the most in our culture today are men and women of God that will stand up and more than just give their life for faith, but will say, you know what, I'm not for any side, but I have come here on behalf of God to stand up and speak the truth. Where are those folks? Where are those folks that stand up and say, you know, it's not about Democrats or Republicans, it's about the Word of God. I was talking to a couple of guys the other day, and you, you can stone me a little later, it's fine with me. Uh, and a uh, guy said, well, you know, I just, I just, I just hate that, that we have sanctuary cities. And I said, well, pretty tough. He said, you know, it just, it just it should never happen. I said, well, the you know, only problem about it is, is that God, when they went into Israel, he, he made these sanctuary cities. Don't tell me you're one of them. And I said proudly, you voted for Joe Biden? I said, man, what gave you that? Well, you're for sanctuary cities. I said, well, no, 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 I'm for, for having a sanctuary city in a state because God designed that in his original plan when the children of Israel went into the promised land so people that were struggling that had done something wrong can go to the sanctuary city. And as long as they stay there and they don't go outside the borders, they're okay. And he said, well, if that's not the most stupid thing I've ever heard, well, bring that up with God. Well, I just, I just can't believe that there's a Christian today that's actually a Democrat. I said, do I have to say this again? I'm a, I'm a God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian. And just go with what the book says. Oh, you're one of those radicals. You got me there. Antipas was one of those guys, by his very name, he says, he, he, he stood out as a witness against all. And they killed him for it. I know where you live. The problem is that God looks at him and says, but, 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 but nevertheless, whoops, nevertheless, I, I have a few things we need to talk about. Notice verse 14. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those that hold to the teaching of the, of the Nicolaitans. That, he says that inside the church, there are people that say they believe and they trust Christ, but they, they hold to a theology that is against Scripture. Our job as, as the followers of Jesus Christ is to take up the text of God's Word and say, if this is what it says, my job is to follow it. The teachings of Balaam. Balaam was the prophet that counseled Balak as the children of Israel had run, had, had, were, were in the middle of a fight and he, he taught Balak to put a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel and this stumbling block was connected to idolatry, to eat things sacrificed to, to, to idols and sexual immorality. If, if the church in Pergama had those who held to the doctrine of Balaam, it showed that they had tendencies both toward idolatry and immorality. That's why the Bible says that we're not to be like the world. We're to come out from the world. We're to stand against the world. 
One of the great fallings of our culture today is that we've become so mushy on our idea as to what is right and what is wrong. We have sold ourselves to popular acceptance so that that which is dysfunctional and destructive not only becomes acceptable, but becomes popular. I, I never would have thought that in our country that we would make sexual preference a legal right. I want you to think about that. Sexual preference and sexual identity in our world today. is a protected right. To disagree with the correctness of sexual sin labels you a racist in our culture. Come on. was watching a video of a mom who was standing against the school board saying that she, she, she didn't want her daughter to have to worry about boys going into the girls' bathroom. And people were booing her and the school board disagreed with her. Come on, guys. We have become like Rome. I want to read you a quote from Cicero, a Roman statesman during the time of this very time that Jesus was riding to Pergamum. This is what Cicero said. It sounds like an American president. You heard me. Complete trash. If, if there is anyone who thinks that young men should not be allowed to love the love of many women, he's extremely severe. I am, I am not able to deny the principle he stands on, but he contradicts not only with the freedom that age allows, but also with the customs and allowances of our ancestors. We in, when indeed was this not done, did, when did anyone find fault with it? When was such permission denied? When was it what is now allowed, was not allowed. Cicero is saying, come on, guys, it's only fair. A man should be able to do whatever he deems right. His self-identity matters more than principle. The angel said, I know that you live in the middle of idolatry and immorality. The Nicolaitans were about sectarianism and immorality. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the title Nicolaitans, divided to, in, in its two words, has an idea of a proud authority and hierarchical separatism. The name Nicolaos really means to, con to, to conquer the people. According to the ancient commentators, the Nicolaitans also approved immorality. As Christians, there should never be a time where we look down on anyone because of the color of their skin or their heritage or their finances. There are those that would look at my stance and say, well, Carl, aren't you being a racist and intolerant? I don't care if a man wants to be gay. 
but I do care if a seven-year-old boy wants to wear his hair long so that he can go in the bathroom at school with my granddaughter. Shouldn't have to worry about that. In James 2, 8, and 9, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you are doing right, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted of the law by lawbreakers. James is talking about there's a rich man that comes into the, to the synagogue to worship and they looked at the rich man because he had a lot of stuff and said, here, you sit in this important seat and, and you guys that are poor, you, you sit in the back. There should never be a time where, where we separate people because of their wealth or because of their color. We should love all people, all people equally. But that doesn't mean that we don't stand on the authority of God's word as to what is right as what is wrong. Have you ever... You ever wondered what people call you behind your back? Do you have, do you have a nickname? <clears throat> you know, I, I used to be really big. Now I'm just pleasantly plump. <clears throat> I'm a little fluffy instead of a lot. Before COVID hit, and, I was visiting with a family of one of our church members and was down at the waiting room at Baylor and this lady said, man, I just, I just love our pastor. Boy, I just love him. I said, well, he seems like a nice guy. I said, you know, and I, I'm so proud of him. You know, Brother Carl has lost so much weight. This lady's sister that never met me was kind of sitting beside me and you know I was taking up a chair and a fourth you know used to I used to take up a chair and a half now I just take up a chair and a fourth I, I used to walk down a plane aisle to get on the plane seat and I could see the people praying and gnashing their teeth saying God please don't let him sit by me you know so so anyway this lady kind of looked at me and she said sis did, can you say that again she said well you know I'm so proud of our pastor he's lost a lot of weight she kind of looked at me and said, well, I think I found it. He's still pretty fluffy. <laughs> she said, have you really lost a lot of weight? And I said, well, yes, ma'am, 160 pounds. And she said, 160 pounds, and you're still fat. You must have been really, really fat. And I said, you know, Master ma'am, I, I was pretty big. She said, well, well, how fat are you now? I said, well... <laughs> I still got some handles to hold on to. She said, yeah, I bet you squish your wife. You're just fluffy. And I said, well, ma'am, that's fine. You can call me fluffy. I've met her several times now in the last 15 years, and she'll look at me and she'll say, how you doing, fluffy? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, sis. How are you? She calls me kind of fluffy now, and we tease each other. Can I ask you a question? When you're not around, what do, what do people call you? I'm being really honest. What do they call you? Some of the most important people in your life probably call you mom or dad or grandma or grant. But I mean, when they're funnered about you and they're trying to describe you, my mother calls me Dino. It's because I'm, I'm so stubborn. Y'all heard that story. It's her description of me, and I, I know it's a term of endearment. I could argue with the fence post. That's my mom. She calls me Dino. And uh, but, but to be honest with you, what I'd really like to know is, is what does Jesus call you? You know, when he's, when he's up in heaven talking to the angels, 
Does he say, you know, this is, this is my friend? One of these days, I'm going to die and go to heaven, and you know who I want to meet? I want to meet Antipas. I want to meet the guy that's, that's never been mentioned everywhere. But the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, this is the man that stands against all. As my witness, he speaks the truth and he's fair and he's right. I want to meet Antipas. I know it's going to happen. Jesus is going to look at one of the animals and said, go get my buddy. And, and when Antipas comes in the room, I have no doubt that Jesus is going to stand up and says, hey guys, Antipas is in the room. Come on in, son. I've got a guy who wants to meet you. In America today, the church needs to become labeled not in correlation with which side of the political fence we fall on, but that we are a people of God that stand up for God and stand up for God to all as his faithful witness. That is the only way that America is going to be healed. That's why I asked Shelley to sing that, that hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. To the church, the angel said, repent. Which means to stop and turn back to God. Or I will soon come to you and I'll fight against you with the sword of my mouth. The angel said, you're either with them or you're with me. There's no riding the fence. There's no me alongside of them. It's just me. A story is told of a young man in Vietnam, and there's the, the Viet Cong are shooting all around him, and they've jumped in this foxhole. He just met this young guy, and he, he said, Who are you? And he introduces himself, and he said, What are you? And he said, Well, Sometimes I'm a Christian, sometimes I'm a Buddhist, and sometimes I'm Shintao, and he, he pulls up this chain and he said, here, rub my rabbit's foot. Next to his rabbit's foot is a cross. It's a, it's a crescent moon. He's got all the bases covered. Listen, brother and sister of Christ, As a follower of Jesus Christ, there's only one base to cover. I stand for Jesus. Please stand, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love and your grace. God, thank you that you said that we are to repent and come back alongside of you to be your children. Father, thank you that you promised us that you would always walk with us, that we would never, never stand alone.
Father, I pray that as a church, as we, as we decide, we discern, God, how can we be a part of redeeming our culture that is lost? Father, I pray that we would be like your faithful martyr, Antipas. We'd stand for you and stand against all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'd like to pray while we're closing with me, while we're closing our worship service out, I'll be waiting for you in the back. Bring it home.